So I'm Stu Bennington and uh, from EMC, and today I'm going to talk about some of the themes actually that Beth just touched on um, related to OpenStack and some of the other what we see technology mega trends that are happening in the telco environment, software-defined networking and network function virtualization. So um, I am actually co-presenting with David Fick from Oracle. And so what I'm going to do first is to cover some of the broader landscape, look at some of the environmental issues that are causing the uh, the, uh, the impact of these networks and also how they fit together, right? Because as, uh, as Beth said, you know, OpenStack's great and there are environmental conditions that lend themselves to those technologies. But at the same time, there's other pieces to the puzzle, not the least of which is the network itself. You know, how do you actually get to the cloud in order to take advantage of the cloud? So we'll talk about how those fit together. And then David's going to come up and talk more specifically about what does this mean for workloads that are applied to the network? And how does this have implications for the management infrastructure and things like resiliency, reliability, and some of the more fine-grained uh, challenges that are taking place? So... Um, to start with, um, you know, a high-level problem statement, you know, what do we see? We see an increasingly competitive environment for delivery of services and applications. Um, there's, you know, whoops. That is that. So you got the, you got the over the top. embedded base and hasn't in the past been designed for sort of real-time um, resiliency or changing. But meanwhile, you've got this demand that fluctuates pretty wildly and can spike and flow and have um, locational dependencies. So you have the problem of both wasted capacity as well as potentially losing customers if you get too much congestion for proper performance. Example, um, you know, a rule of thumb in mobile networks in the RAN is, okay, I'll look at my average peak capacity and then I'll build in a 30% overhead to that. And when I start to get closer, then I'll just build in more overhead. Well, I mean, in the past that worked okay, but now... 50% is the 50%, okay, even better. So, so that's, a, that's an investment in the happiness of your customer, but... Of course, it'd be better if we can start to match. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you know, you hear this fabled um, Google metric where with G scale, you know, their data center interconnect, they've got like 99% capacity utilization at any point in time. Well, it's a very different environment, but there is a lesson to be learned, which is the more dynamic and, and uh, tied you can make to the, uh, to the demand, the better. Um, and then, in, whoops, I said I knew how to use these buttons and I just lied here. Okay. Um, so then you've got the challenges with, hey, there's, there's top line, not with everybody necessarily, but a lot of operators are seeing some flattening top line growth. And then in, at the same time, an increasingly complex operating environment. Some of that's driven by the legacy products. Some of that's driven by the permutation of applications, um, the linkages that happen between functions and the network. So it's a, it's, it's a challenge. Um, propagation of end user application, the third platform, as Beth was saying, hey, you've got all of this stuff happening with Internet of Things and big data and machine to machine, mobility, mobility becoming you know, almost more of a feature than an actual service difference because that's just another way to access the applications at the end of the day. And then you know, the good news, though, is that you have this emergence and maturing of some of these empowering technologies. A lot of them are new. A lot of them are not so um, you know, mature yet. But uh, they hold a lot of promise, and ultimately that they, they bring us to a destination that we sort of know we need to get to. So what does that entail? Um, so network, network function virtualization and software-defined networking are complementary to OpenStack. They're not a replacement. They're not a substitute. Um, but they do tend to have synergies when you bring them all together. Let me just take a quick show of hands. How many people know about these technologies, aside from David, who I know is – okay, so everybody knows. I don't need to define them. Um, okay, so I'll bore you with one slide on the business value. Um, what, I, what I like to say, first of all, is, of course, you know, they help transition to an IT-like network infrastructure, faster upgrades, you know, service turn up, all of those things, making it a demand-driven architecture, you know, so you get this better end-user experience, you get this better yield management potentially. Um, and, you know, the nice thing is, you know, you've got kind of the revenue aspect, you've got the OpEx aspect and the CapEx aspect, so ultimately you can address in theory, all of those components of the financial model. It's not going to happen overnight, and it's not it's certainly not a panacea, but there are benefits to be had, and uh, some of these studies show that those benefits can be significant. And it's important to remember that as challenging as it is, some of the competitors, maybe most of the competitors in this environment, are also pursuing these technologies and are also trying to accomplish some of these cost savings and certainly try tying you know, this to new, some of these new revenue opportunities. So the competitive 
forcing function is, uh, is out there as well. So these are some illustrations. I kind of like them because you, know, you don't often see how all the pieces fit together. Um, what we see with OpenStack and how it ties to NFE and SDN is number one is you've got this service orchestration capability. It's one of the toughest nut to crack, but you know the idea is you want to bind storage, compute, and network resources more holistically than NFE and SDN can do alone, and vice versa. You know OpenStack tends to be fairly data center centric, uh, but of course you've got to get to the data center and you've got to get between data centers and get to the end users. So you need the north south as well as the east west. Um, there are the MANO components, the management and orchestration components, which are really important. They, they enable the virtual infrastructure and p potential uh, virtual network function management. And then this, this notion of the cloud stack that bridges the VNFs to the NFVI, the virtualized infrastructure, as well as the control plane, right? SDN at the end of the day is an abstracted control plane from the user plane, and you're trying to automate a lot of functions that previously required human intervention. So. OpenStack can provide at different, you know, with different perspectives, a piece of the puzzle. In the ONF diagram, they show it as, hey, this is your, your kind of open API to tie these VNFs that the Etsy talks about, and that's the kind of ecosystem of ideas, to the control plane, maybe that's open daylight or ONOS, and then the, uh, the virtualized infrastructure. This is ONF, so of course they always have to put OpenFlow in there. OpenFlow doesn't have to be the southbound API. There's a lot of people who don't believe OpenFlow is a good long-term solution. I happen to think that there are some good use cases for it. It does give you to the granularity of the primitives and so forth, but that could be something else too. That could be NetConf, that could be you know, a, a REST-based interface, that could be you know, any, or, any or all of these above. It could even be a, a legacy um, um, API. And in fact, <clears throat> one of the nice things about this abstraction is that if you have domain controller functions, you can enable some of the legacy infrastructures with clients that are SDN capable and not have to replace all that in infrastructure. And in the telco environment, that's very, very attractive. Um, in addition, OpenStack is also part of the, uh, the Arno definition of the open NFV environment relatively same depiction of the function, but the idea is to provide this capability for binding the storage compute network resources to, to the uh, virtualized applications. Okay, um, from a use case standpoint, um, there, there's, there's literally dozens of use cases that can be enabled. Some are more applicable to others. What I tried to do is to put some use case categories here where I didn't have to list everything, but already this looks more like the notes pages than the than the slide itself, so uh, forgiveness there. But you know, at the highest level, <clears throat> in an NFE world, you've got NFEI as a service. So in other words, you're, you're sort of monetizing your network assets in a programmable, virtualized, cloud-centric way. Maybe this is for large enterprise accounts, you know, kind of a hosted private cloud or a hybrid cloud. This could be for retail carriers, for example, MVNOs. And the OpenStack role here is the idea that you can tie in these pluggable cloud APIs to facilitate interoperability and extensibility of the functions um, above and beyond what you would do with NFE alone. Similarly, VNFs as a service, coupled with, with things like SDN application-based forwarding, give you the potential for things like a programmable, you know, customized market of one, fast provisioning times, burstability, calendaring, um, adjustable resiliency, you know, so we think of bandwidth on demand, there's also resiliency on demand, there's also failover on demand, and latency on demand. The idea is you're monetizing every aspect of your network based on the end user's willingness to pay. Um, the OpenStack role here is, again, to tie this improved liquidity of matching the demand, which is, which is embodied in the applications, with the supply, which is embodied, embodied in the NFVI. Um, so these are sort of the end user use cases, and within them there's all kinds of you know, sub-use cases, as we all know. There's virtual CPE, there's virtual you know, um, you know, a packet core, there's virtualized you know, uh, video you know, functions for cable operators and so forth. But these are kind of generally you know, ways to categorize these buckets. On the other side of the operational use cases, um, things like you know, network slicing is a term that's used. It's sort of the flip side of this NFVI as a service where you can have, you have virtual partitions of the, of the infrastructure by a division or by a service type or you know, experimentation. You know, like with, in a mobile carrier, you might say, okay, for all of these prepaid mobile phones that all the drug dealers are using, we'll experiment with technologies, and if their service is more questionable, then we can at least quarantine that from the, the higher you know, paying uh, customers. 
um, overlay and underlay resource mapping. You know, SDN tends to be described as, you know, kind of, hey, it's SDN, it's abstract control plane. What's, what's so complicated about that? Well, these are pretty important distinctions. And overlay tends to be what we think about in our data center cloud world where you have VMs and VM connectivity and maybe some extensible protocols to, to manage that, uh, that, those VM movements. But at the same time, again, as Beth said, you know, you've got this whole network out there that once you leave the data center, the Amazons of the world don't have to worry about it, but the Verizons do. So you've got optical infrastructure, you've got routing infrastructure, you've got, you know, um, Ethernet switching, you've got all kinds of pieces, you've got mobility infrastructure that stand to benefit from, you know, this, this dynamic capability and this uh, programmability, but it's a different you know, issue to tackle than the overlay. So those are sort of two pieces of the puzzle. So OpenStack here is better binding of all of these resources together in a way that, you know, depending on the function, you can look at things from an end-to-end -end standpoint, and no matter what the, the VNF is and what the function is, as you can tie those together operationally, you can get better performance, better utilization, better reliability because you're minimizing human error. So there's all sorts of things that are, that are capable. This becomes even more attractive when you understand that you have legacy stuff out there that isn't gonna go away anytime soon. And if we can enable it for this environment, we can, we can perpetuate that, that length of time where things are usable. And that's attractive financially as well as uh, you know, operationally. Okay. Um, so here's the you know kind of NFV periodic chart. I think everybody knows it. What I tried to do is to take a cut at, okay, so the Etsy model in all its glory is kind of this black and white background here. So you've got really three major pieces. You've got the the you know NFVI, so the virtualized infrastructure, and I've overlaid these boxes by the way. You've got the VNFs themselves, which are the you know the applications that are abstracted, and then you've got the Mano infrastructure over here that ties all this together. So the cha there's a lot of challenges here, and, and David, I think, is going to drill down into some more specifics here, but one of the most important is this idea of a hybrid network environment. You will have a long period of time, maybe forever, where you've got legacy coexisting with the new and the virtualized, and you can't have that exist as just you know, a perpetuated overlay. They need to be integrated together. They need to make use of these uh, depreciated assets that are out there. Um, and in, in doing so, you know, right now we've, you know, we've heard about it all morning. You've got these proprietary distros that might not look alike. Um, community offerings are trying to get there, like this open Mano environment for tying them together. But that's still very early, and so that's that's a work in progress. That's going to take some time. On the VNF manager, so that's sort of this piece here. So the the, the holistic management of the different VNFs environments. There's really no universal solution for managing those across all these multiple vendor ecosystems. There's some thinking in the, you know, in the, uh, the telco working group that you could use heat, maybe some extensions to kind of get you, get you there as far as you can. But at the end of the day, this is all about abstracted interfaces and definitions that need to be holistically defined. And it's the, the give and take of abstraction versus specificity, specificity and functionality that uh, is the challenge there. And then finally, um, there's this API functional trade-off between abstraction. So a lot of these def in, in OpenStack, it's a REST, typically a REST-based interface, which is good for abstraction, but not good for for you know specific granular functionality to get to device primitives and things like that. Whereas in the opposite case, once you get down, you know, again back to that diagram where we showed uh, OpenFlow, you can get that granularity and get very specific functions, but uh, but that has to be coupled with okay, are you drifting toward a proprietary implementation versus an open implementation? Or can you strike a balance where you might have domain controllers that tie into an orchestrator? So you have a hierarchical path computation model. So there's, there's all these decisions that need to be made, but there's no single answer uh, today. The good news is there's a lot of open um, environments and open code that take advantage of you know, different hardware you know, environments, whether it's bare metal or something that's based on hypervisors or containers. Um, as an abstraction layer, and then virtualized resources that then talk through, you know, Nova and Cinder and Spark, Neutron, up to the VNFs, and then for the underlay, you've got the communities like Open Daylight and Onos and and uh, you know the ONF that help tie together the overlay and over, uh, underlay virtualization and abstraction of the control plane. So this is all the stuff that you know telcos have to deal with that the cloud players don't necessarily have to deal with. So I'll summarize and then hand it off to David. So, whoops, we've got the, uh, 
We've got the evolution toward a programmable virtualized network. It's a necessity. It's where we need to go, but it's going to take some time to get there. Um, it will be evolutionary due to both of the financial realities as well as you know things like maturity of the standards, maturity of inner working, participation of the vendor community. And uh, you know the good news is that OpenStack is a key enabler of this transition, and it becomes even more compelling when you couple it with advances that are happening on the SDN and NFV uh, space. But this is an evolution as well. There's technical challenges and integrations going, you know, that'll come along the way. Uh, but these, you know, sort of these three pieces of the puzzle ultimately will be resident in this evolution toward a programmable telco cloud model. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to David. Uh, as Stu uh, introduced already, I'm David Fick. I work for uh, Oracle as a senior software architect. I, uh, Oracle's kind of a small company, but uh, I happen to work in the communications business unit. So that's the, the business unit within Oracle where we have our telecommunications related uh, products, anywhere from the you know um, core applications running the core network all the way up to the OSS BSS side. So that's kind of the, the, the background in terms of uh, uh, Oracle's involvement or in, in this discussion as it were. Uh, and then personally myself, I've been uh, working on the telecommunications space for about uh, over 15 years, um, basically delivering or help build um, and design uh, kind of core platforms that are used for telecommunications applications. So dealing with availability and manageability, things like that. And then that platform is then used for uh, delivering actual telecommunications uh, solutions. So that's been my focus over the years. Um, so uh, this is kind of a maybe an overworn uh, analogy, and we saw it a little bit this morning already. But I'm going to I'm going to go back to it anyway. And so we have the the question of pets pets or cattle, right? So it, and, and within this context, I'm just thinking about telecommunications applications. So you know, if we had to ask that question, what you know, are telecommunications applications today at least are they pet or pets or cattle? Um, and so we certainly we can go to the proverbial dictionary and look it up, right? Now don't go to Daniel's uh, uh, Webster or Oxford to look this up, but we have a pet application, right? And so we have your typical definition of a pet application, right? It has an, a unique name. Uh, you raise it, you care for it. If it gets sick, you bring it back to a healthy state, right? So, um, and beside that definition, what would we have? Well, we'd have a picture of a telecommunications application because it is kind of the textbook definition or the dictionary definition of a pet application. Um, sorry, I couldn't come up with a better way to depict a telecommunications application. That's the best I could do. But anyway, it so it, it is just kind of prototypical um, uh, pet application, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, that's just the way that the world has worked and the way that the industry has evolved. Um, but I guess the question is, why are they pets today, right? Um, and, and, and what does that mean moving forward? And so I think one of the biggest aspects certainly is the, the way they're delivered today, right? Is that it's a, uh, they have these applications or solutions have dedicated hardware. They're, they're integrated from the hardware all the way up to the application, right? And again, kind of the textbook definition of a, of a pet server, as it were. Um, but there's more to that, right? I mean, if we disaggregate the application from the hardware, it's not just magically a, a cattle application or server at this point, right? There's more to it than that. Um, and again, a lot of this stuff is going to, I'm going to be reinforcing what Beth was talking about, hopefully. Um, but um, anyway, just, just to say there will be some overlap there, but hopefully it's still, still useful. Um, so part of it is kind of a, a, a technological uh, approach to the problem, and a part of it is requirements. A lot of it is really requirements, but um, is driven by the requirements. But first of all, there's traditionally telecommunications applications are a little bit different in terms of um, kind of the style of application relative to most or many uh, IT applications. There, there are some that you could say kind of bleed between the two. But um, one of the things is pr predominantly very stateful applications. And, and again, a key difference is, and I would argue that a lot of IT applications have state. They just happen to store it off in a database somewhere. But rather than doing that, telecommunications applications very often, at least the ones in the core network, are storing that data in memory, right, for performance reasons. Um, Another difference in a lot of compared to a lot of IT applications is these telecommunications applications are creating and managing long-term service connections all the way from service establishment to the to the teardown. I mean, just imagine a voice circuit, right? I mean, that's set up from when you start your call to the end of the call. It's not a bunch of IT, uh, HTTP requests that are going out individually that have really no state behind them, right? This is something that has to live for the, the term of that particular service and you want it to be available, obviously, too. Um, they're highly distributed and highly redundant solutions as well, including geographic redundancy, as Beth mentioned. Uh, and, that, and again, that's a very, and again, that's not 
completely unique within the cloud today, but is kind of intrinsic to telecommunication solutions today. And then also very often they're real time or very near real time uh, performance requirements. And so that again drives um, kind of some or kind of calls out some of the differences between what kind of a, a typical telecommunications app versus a typical IT or enterprise app. Um, another aspect is the requirements that are placed on the application. So again, going back to reinforcing the availability pack aspect. So there's very strict um, service availability requirements in terms of applications needing to provide five plus of avail you know five six seven nines of availability. Um, and, and again, a, th a thing I would very much emphasize here too is that that includes maintenance actions or upgrades that are taken on with, within the, the infrastructure or within the network. So it's not like you can just say, oh, well, we're doing an upgrade and that doesn't count. It does count. Um, and so that's where you see that the, that's a very harsh requirement that has to be met and one that we have to keep in mind as we're talking about moving telco applications to the cloud. Um, and certainly the applications elements, as I said, are designed to be very redundant and distributed. Again, that's not really that unusual within the IT space as well. I think maybe maybe the more the differences are the, uh, or some of the differences at least are the the way that we the, the problem has been solved within the telco space. Um, certainly, the, the 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 workloads that are very highly uh, network intensive, um, in terms of both. Uh, so a lot of this goes back to the communications protocols that the applications are implementing. You go look at those specs. The timing windows on on the protocol exchanges are very very small. Right, you can't. You're not waiting seconds for a reply, right? You're waiting for microseconds or milliseconds at most for a reply back, and so they're they're really um, uh, again puts a very high uh, high bar to, to be about, to be met for the applications in terms of networking behavior, and that leads to very high bandwidth and low latency requirements. It's basically a necessity, um, and and uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. And then finally, you have the operations side, and this again goes back to the upgrades again. But the in-service upgrades are mandatory throughout the stack, so it doesn't matter if you're changing the firmware, you're updating the hardware, the middleware, the OS, the application, whatever it is. It it's all. Um, that has to be done in service. It's just not acceptable to take it out, of, uh, do a forklift up upgrade, and and take things out of service. Uh, and then another complexity, which doesn't really affect the transition to the cloud, but I think is another thing to understand, is that these applications operate in a broader environment, right? It's not like a Facebook or whatever, where okay, I have a GUI, and that's how everyone logs into the web page, and that's how they get they get to it, right? Um, these applications have many different interfaces that they have to provide. They have to provide probably a GUI. They have to provide a CLI. They have to tie into protocol-based interfaces like SNMP or NetConf or whatever to tie into higher-level management protocols. So there's a lot of complexity there as well. And so they're, they have to be designed for that uh, up front. So now we're going to move telco applications to the cloud. And I, I think along the lines of what Beth said, you know, it, it's, it's not maybe five years ago it would have been, well, you know, maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. But I think now it's just a question of if, uh, not if, but when, right? Um, so, the, so now let, let's just take the simple case of what I talked about. You know, we have the telco apps. They're very de or delivered today, very much integrated and uh, with the hardware, right? Well, we disaggregate the hardware, right? Well, do we magically have a, a, a cattle app, right, like a web server or something like that? Well, no, not really. Um, but I would say is that basically, to me, a telco app is kind of a, a breed of cattle, right? It's maybe it's not all the way to that the, the far end of the spectrum necessarily, but it's a breed of cattle. But it's just one that with very specific performance and availability SLAs and other requirements as well. But we'll we'll just leave it at that. And I think that's kind of an important thing I would say as a takeaway is that. Um, especially as we're talking about we're trying to work with the OpenStack community is that it shouldn't be just a matter of saying, well, we're just trying to get OpenStack to meet telco use cases. It's really a matter of trying to provide additional capabilities like being able to guarantee SLAs at the performance and availability level. And then if you could do that, that would meet a lot of the telco requirements as and surprise, surprise, probably would help with a lot of enterprise apps as well. But then it would also apply to other verticals as well, health, health services, financial services. I think those all... So, so it's not really just a matter of, okay, well, you got to get OpenStack so it supports the telco market. It's really a matter of providing the capabilities within OpenStack to meet the telco market and then also broadening that to, to, because those requirements will also help meet other markets' needs as well. Um, and so that's that. Um, so now, obviously, we have a, it's an industry in transition, right? We're going to move these existing telco applications in, into the cloud. Um, 
Now, there's certainly, you know, may, at you know, some point there will be greenfield applications that maybe are more cloud native uh, uh, from the telco perspective. Um, but today there's a huge amount of, of uh, solutions that are out there today. They work, um, and we're not just going to walk away from that. The service providers aren't going to walk away from those solutions. But we still want to, at some point, leverage the capabilities of, of the cloud to, to make, you know, the, the, the delivery and the updates to these more agile. Um, so where do the changes have to happen? Well, one is certainly the applications have to change, right? We're, we're disaggregating it from the hardware. The deployment model is going to be different. The orchestration model is going to be different. Um, but beyond that, there are enhancements that have to happen at the cloud infrastructure side. And so that's really the, the point of the rest of the pres presentation is to talk about some of these changes. Now, I've kind of grouped these at a very high level. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about, and then you could divide them up however you want. But this is just kind of a, an initial list to kind of talk kind of get the discussion going and kind of give you a feel for the type of changes that are envisioned for within OpenStack to help facilitate um, the telco workloads. Um, and I, I would also say that these aren't necessarily, what I've listed here are not, or what I get into, are not necessarily gaps. I think they're capabilities that are required. Some of them there are actually in OpenStack today. There's a few, not a lot. We'll call those out. Um, but for the most part, they are gaps. But, um, but the point is that the OpenStack has added some capabilities that are, are relevant to telco workloads. So now I, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, uh, Stuart showed this as well, and I don't want to get into it too much. I, I mean, I, I will echo that uh, Beth's uh, sentiment that NFE is very immature. It's, for one thing, is I, I'm amazed that the number of people that seem to think that NFE is a standard. It's not a standard. It's a, a bunch of specifications with a reference architecture. And, 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 that, and that's not the people that created aren't calling it standards, but a lot of people have that impression, right? And so you have vendors that are coming in and trying to sell an NFE solution when, or a standard NFE solution when there, there is no standard, right? So we're kind of building the car as we're driving down the road, unfortunately, and, and that's always a little bit of a, a challenge with um, standards-based work. But anyway, it, it helps frame the discussion, if nothing else. And so... Um, Obviously, this is a pretty involved diagram. I, uh, hopefully, everyone here knows NFV in, inside and out. Everyone knows what a PNF is, a VNF, a VNF manager, right? Um, but I'm just going to just really quickly just call out the ones that are relevant to this part of uh, the discussion or the, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So then we have the NFVI, which is the, the physical and the virtual resources, and, as well as the containment layer, um, whether that's virtualization or, or a, con a container technology. Um, we have the virtualized uh, infrastructure manager, in this case, OpenStack. Obviously, there's other potential virtualized uh, infrastructure managers as well. The other key aspect, and, and Stuart touched on this, is the Mano stack, right? It's the quote Mano stack. Essentially, it's all these elements here on the right that are designed to orchestrate and manage the, all the elements on the left, basically. And certainly, the Vim or the OpenStack is part of that. Um, but the key part, it, the takeaway here, is that we have the higher level um, pieces here as well, right? The what it's so-called VNF managers and the orchestrator that are doing the higher level, either orchestrating a set of VNFs or dealing with orchestrating across the entire network. And then, of course, you have the VNFs themselves. That's what all this is for, right? All this, all this at work is, well, other than providing the services they provide, it, it, all of this is there so that the VNFs can, can operate. So going back to kind of my, my grouping of, of, of uh, changes within OpenStack or capabilities that OpenStack need, so these are some basic features. And so it's kind of a grab bag of, of different things that I know um, that I've heard from uh, on the telco side that really need to be there within OpenStack. Again, it's not an exhaustive list, but a starting point. So first of all, we have networking enhancements. Uh, you know, we've talked, uh, you know, Neutron's getting bashed all the time, right? There's, there's plenty of work to be done there. But some of the particular things within the networking space that I think are important, certainly there's VLAN trunking within VMs. Certainly today, that's, that type of information is not exposed up to the VMs or the VNFs. Um, and, but there are certain telco applications that are uh, that needed to provide that type of uh, or have that type of capability. Certainly, complete IPv6 support. So essentially, feature parity with IPv4. Obviously, the, there's the if you just do the comparison of the two, right? They're they're not in alignment in terms of full support. And that's something that's very important in the telco uh, world, right? As they're rolling out more and more equipment, you you know, there's a lot of service providers you cannot. You cannot roll out things with IPv4, IPv4 anymore, right? It has to be IPv6. Um, and so that, that's going to be a very important thing. Certainly, disablement of port security rules for packet processing workloads, that's something that actually went into Kilo. So that's a, not a, really a gap within OpenStack, but something that's there today. Um, the combination of L3HA and DVR. Um, so DVR is there to help with the uh, performance bottleneck of the network controller. 
Um, and then L3HA is there to provide redundancy for the L3 agent, but the two do not mix. And so those are the type of issues. Uh, so, you know, it's both, you're trying to address both availability and performance, but you can't have both right now. It's either one or the other. And so obviously that, that's something that has, to, that has to change. And then there's also the, the migration of existing applications into the cloud. Again, these, these applications are not going away. They're just going to be migrated to the cloud. And so, um, there are certain ways that those solutions or those applications work that are going to need to be supported realistically by OpenStack. So, and these are just, again, a couple of examples. So one is a shared volume, being able to share a volume between multiple VM instances. That's something I understand that Cinder supports today, but Nova does not yet. And that's a very common way for um, kind of uh, certain telco applications that when they're doing clustering, they, they rely on a shared volume or sh shared data space where they can uh, store cluster data. And so that's a very common use case. Um, so Certainly you have application virtual IP management. So certainly in a lot of cases, Neutron wants to do all that for you, right? You, you assign a, vir a floating IP, same kind of notionally same as a virtual IP. But in the telco space, the, the applications need, to, need and want to manage those, uh, those virtual IPs. One thing is for speed, uh, and, and, uh, and that's really the main thing is, right, they want to be able to, they don't want to rely on anything else, right? They want to be able to have control over those, um, where those virtual IPs are placed and when they're, mo when they're moved and where they're moved. Um, the next category is management and orchestration. So just at a high level, I think the kind of the first two are kind of goals more than anything specific. Certainly anything that the Mano stack needs to do in terms of interacting with, with OpenStack or, the, or a VIM needs to be orchestratable um, by the higher level Mano elements, the orchestrator or the VNF managers. Um, uh, you know, this all comes back to the REST APIs and be able to, to being able to perform all the operations you need through those APIs, basically. Um, and then another thing that I think a lot of people don't even uh, always think about, but many of the specifics of the OpenStack, I don't say many, but there are specifics of the OpenStack deployment model that kind of filter out into the APIs, right? And so, uh, and again, Neutron is the whipping boy here, but is another example where when you're going to create a network, you're going to go create subnets and things like that. There are very specific things about how you do that that... Um, either require a priori knowledge or require you to be very, very careful to make sure that you don't get caught by that. And so those are the type of things where I think that it would be much better if the data model that's exposed by OpenStack abstracted those things away. And I don't think that's even unique to the telco world. I've heard that same criticism of Neutron just from general users, right? Most users don't want to deal with all the nitty gritty, gritty details of, I want to have this router and I have to attach it to the subnet. And they just want to have, they want to the, the spin up their VMs. They want to have appropriate level of network connectivity and not have to worry about the details. That's it's kind of the same idea here. You just bring that, that, the, the data model up a little bit higher so that some of those details don't have to be exposed. Certainly there's things like resource reservation and, uh, and uh, oops, oh, that's the, um, resource reservation and allocation interfaces. Certainly you can reserve uh, resources today or you can allocate resources, but there's also notion of the idea of being able to guarantee that you have a set of resources available uh, even for future use. Um, things like service chaining for bumping the wire at VNF. So if you're going to try to chain together a firewall with a load balancer with a you know intrusion detection system, be able to do a service chain for those kind of bumping the wire VNFs. Um, on demand and auto scaling. Um, again, so this is going to be something as uh, application load changes to be able to either ha have the uh, mano elements come in and say, I want to scale out this application further or scale it in, obviously. Uh, but then also potentially have the, the infrastructure deal with that itself. Now these last couple elements all come back to the the manageability. Basically, the the, the Mano stack needs to be able to interrogate OpenSAF. Uh, OpenSAF, sorry, that's another project I worked on. OpenStack. Um, to know what's going on, right? What's going on with the system? What is the state of the the resources? And so. There needs to be notification-driven uh, interfaces, so kind of a, a push interface where the, the Mano elements can receive information about the state uh, and configuration of the, the different physical and virtual resources as well as the VNFs. And then there needs to be a pull model as well. So the, the Mano, for more longer-term um, type of operations and analysis, analysis, you need to be able to pull metrics or data about the, those same resources in terms of their operation, their usage, and their state. You need, the, they need to, uh, the Mano elements need to be able to pull that information out as well. Now, a big thing, and, and Beth was touching on this as well, is the performance aspect as well. So um, there needs to be ways within OpenStack to ensure that 
uh, a given workload has exclusive access to the to its allocated resources, whether that's a CPU at the CPU level, CPU pinning, uh, if it's at the the memory level, no over a subscription of that memory, large page sizes to support RAMs for for guest allocation. Um, Certainly net, at the network level, separation, as well as the quality of service. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and then also besides that, we also need to control over workload placement. We need to ensure that when you're placing that workload, that you're accounting for the most optimal uh, positioning or placement of that particular workload. So, for example, putting that workload within a, within a given NUMA node to ensure the, the best performance in terms of memory access from that, the workload running on those CPUs. Uh, and then also placement or co-location of, of associated elements um, within the same, uh, within the, at least locate them as close as possible. And that's where you get into things like the affinity filter that's already supported within OpenStack. Um, and then when we get into networking performance, again, we talk about need, needing to be able to support the highest performance network paths, um, whether that's uh, DPDK enhanced Open vSwitch or SRI, uh, SRIOV, which is already supported. Um, and then we get into quality of service, so bandwidth and latency. And again, this, you know, there, there's very hard requirements there that, that we've talked about. But the key thing to understand is it's not, it's not just the average value. Okay, well, I can, my average bandwidth is such and such, right? It's the worst case bandwidth and latency that we need to, especially latency, that needs to be guaranteed. And so there needs to be means to, for, to, to guarantee that level of quality of service that a particular application or, or VM needs. And then finally, minimizing the hops through the system. Um, certainly today with Neutron, if you use tenant networking, you inherently have the, unless you're using DVR, um, you're, you have the inherent bottleneck of everything going through the network controller node. So we need to minimize and make sure that all those hops are minimized. Or you could also argue that you know, in the, when you're open, using open vSwitch, you still have Linux bridges involved as well, right? Why, do we, why, are, why are all these hops necessary? We need to minimize and eliminate anything that's, uh, that's not needed. But of course, you still need to do that while meeting availability and, and reliability requirements. And onto that topic. So um, basically, the, uh, the cloud infrastructure needs to enable these hosted, uh, the, this hosted workload to meet their service availability requirements. And I emphasize service here because um, you know, sometimes availability management or availability numbers can differ a little bit in terms of your perspective of what they really mean. In this case, we're talking about the ability for that application or service to provide its end service. It's not that it's just running, it's actually providing the, the end, end uh, service that it's supposed to be providing. Um, now, the cloud infrastructure doesn't necessarily have to say, have the same level of availability as the application, right? That's part of what the application is designed to do is to, to run on less reliable hardware or, or if there's failures in the software elements as well. But it, the, the numbers still have to be sufficient to enable the application. And so infrastructure service failovers that take many, many seconds are still not going to be acceptable. So now certainly we're going to talk about this in a second. But the application at the, at the, the, the base level, the, the application is the telco applications are going to be managing the, fail, the failovers themselves, right, and ensuring that they're providing service. But there's still going to be other use cases where the, having the, the infrastructure services like Neutron or Nova or whatever they may be available is going to be important. So, for example, the scale out or scale in type of scenarios, right? That's not a case where the application or the, the workload is necessarily the one trying to scale. It may be some other outside mano element that's trying to do that. But if the infrastructure is taking a minute to fail over, that, again, is going to be problematic if there's something that needs to be done immediately. So th those type of requirements have to be met. Um, certainly, there have to be capabilities to ensure VM placement policies and rules to ensure redundant VMs are not placed in the same fault domain. Um, certainly, there's availability zones, but then there's other um, uh, more granular capabilities that need to be uh, managed such that you have the, and that's where this anti-affinity filter within Nova comes into place, um, to make sure that you don't put VMs within the same fault domain. And then, again, the kind of that the dead horse I'm beating is on the upgrades again. Um, certainly upgrades to the cloud infrastructure cannot affect application availability. Um, and I think an important thing to note here is that th this isn't a web server that we're necessarily going to move. And so live migration, while certainly a, a very fine solution for many applications, isn't always going to be sufficient for a certain class of telco applications at least. And so I think that's where we have to think about a little bit more about the orchestration, about um, if you're going to be, you know, if there's going to be an upgrade moving through the infrastructure, the, the cloud infrastructure, how is that communicated? communicated to the workload itself. You can't just say, I'm going to live migrate everything and then everything will be fine because that's not necessarily going to work. 
Uh, and then potentially you may also have you know, communication or notification interfaces to help drive HA within the application themselves. That's more of an optional thing, and I think time will tell whether that's going to be important or not. Um, and then uh, finally, I think kind of another important thing to keep in mind, and this really gets more into when you're talking about how, how are the OpenStack services going to be designed to, um, to support the HA of the applications, the availability management requirements of the applications. Um, and the key thing is that we can't design OpenStack we can't design the applications to be dependent on OpenStack um, or, or their management elements, at least uh, beyond the initial deployment. Uh, obviously, there's going to be interactions there. So uh, in terms of HA, in terms of handling failures, basically, we, we, we want to be able to, the hosted applications need to operate independently of the infrastructure to the, to the extent that they can. And the reason being is if the applications suddenly depend on a Neutron call during a failover, well, now Neutron has to have the same level or higher level of reliability than, than the application requires. And so that's what we want to avoid. So when we're talking about HA, supporting HA uh, within OpenStack for the applications, we want to make sure that you know, we're not in proposing enhancements to OpenStack that then where we expect the applications to be leveraging those capabilities necessarily, unless the, the infrastructure is going to meet the same level of reliability. And then lastly, this is again, uh, I, I'm sure I, Beth or anybody else could come up here, come up with a much longer list, but um, just again, the operations and manageability are, are a key aspect of being able to run and use OpenStack in a, in a large scale um, communications network. Um, again, in service upgrade of the cloud infrastructure, um, you know, I've gone to this to one OpenStack summit, and and I listened. I, I specifically went to a lot of the upgrade-related talks, and they're very informative and very interesting. But the the thing that I took away is that the typical strategy, or very often, not not always, but very often, there's one of two strategies. One is um, you just take the service down, or you can take the control elements down, you upgrade them, and you bring them back up. Well, again, that's not going to work, right? There, there are going to be certain use cases, telco use cases, where the service elements need to be running. Um, the, so the elements are typically running on the controller. They have to be there. They can't be gone for 15 minutes. Um, or the other model is a split mode upgrade, where you have a totally another set of infrastructure, where you bring up the new version of the, the cloud infrastructure, and you slowly migrate everything over. That maybe would work more. I mean, a split mode upgrade is not unusual in the tel telco world, but uh, again, when you're talking about the scale that these uh, the applications are going to need to be deployed in the telco network, that's just not going to be feasible. So um, upgrade strategies, and I think that goes back to a question that came up of, you know, it's not that the, in terms of kind of main uh, long-term support and things like that, to me, part of that is making sure that upgrades, you know, that works between releases. Um, and you can't really put that on the vendors, right, or the, the distro vendors that, I mean, to some degree, they're, they're the ones that provide the assurance of that. But the reality is that OpenStack itself has to have, make sure that the mechanisms are there to ensure that um, an upgrade can actually happen, an in-service upgrade of the infrastructure. And then lastly is just auditing, traceability, um, you know, being able to monitor network paths, so having port mirroring, so if there's a problem in the network, you can go in there and debug what's going on. Certainly things about um, things when you start looking about logging, certainly just much better logging. But one aspect that's come up, and, and I, I know there's been discussions about this in OpenStack, but is, you know, you send it, you, you generate a request, and that goes into Nova, let's say, to, to boot a VM. Well, there's a lot of other things potentially going on within that command, right? They're talk, it's talking to Keystone, it's talking to Neutron, it may be talking to Cinder, things like that. Um, so be able to track those requests throughout the throughout the, the artifacts that are produced by OpenStack, not just say, well, that's this request that came into, into Nova, and then you, somebody else has to go piece everything together to figure out where everything goes. So that's... Uh, Again, this is a, just a very high-level list, some, some simple ideas. There's much more that needs to go into that in terms of the operations and manageability side as well. So with that, I think uh, I'm about out of time anyway, and so I will open it up to any questions. All right, I guess, oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's definitely an enterprise issue as well, yeah. I, I don't know that. I, don't, I mean, I don't have the answer. I mean, there, there are, obviously, Oracle has solutions for that, but whether they're sufficient for 
Um, especially when you get telco workloads on top of that, I think that that's the part that needs to be dug into further. And most likely they're not. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they are because they're, I'm sure they're not. Um, but I mean, that, that, um, and, and I, we didn't really get into that other than touching just on the geographic redundancy part. But I think, and, and you got into that too, right? Is that it's not just what's going on in the data center, right? It's that pipe in between that you have to make sure. Uh, and, and the same problem applies when you're replicating a huge database between data centers for, for um, disaster recovery or geographic. Uh, and it can't be just so, um, you know, it, it's, it has to be a holistic solution. It's not just within the data center, it's the whole, the whole pipe. And that's, you know, a lot of the telco apps that we have within the, uh, within the I don't want to say a lot, but some of them uh, within the Elco, uh, Oracle telecommunications uh, portfolio, they have very specific ways of dealing with that. But um, it's also on a much smaller scale than when you're talking about a full size, you know, Oracle rack database, control, you know, containing terabytes of uh, or petabytes of, of data necessarily. Right. And so that's a, it's a different problem. And I don't think the answer is there yet, but it's something that's, gonna, that's definitely going to have to be solved. Yep. Nope. Yeah. And I, again, like you said, I, there's a lot of overlap between those industries, right, in terms of the disaster recovery, geographic redundancy, all that, right, that, that's uh, very much overlap between those industries. And that's why I think, you know, if we can get OpenStack to, uh, and it's not purely OpenStack's problem, but I mean, if OpenStack can support um, the parts of that, uh, of that use case that they need to, then obviously uh, OpenStack becomes more appealing across other verticals as well. Anything else? All right, well, thank you.